I'm just preparing it for that. So good afternoon, everybody. It is uh, 2 p.m. on five on February 6th. We'd like to bring our Victoria County Council meeting to order. Uh, just prior to that, we would like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held in Unamagi, one of the seven traditional districts of the Mi'kmaq and the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. So with that, the agenda has been circulated to you. Are there any errors? I'm sorry, are there any additions or deletions to the uh, agenda this afternoon? It's moved by Councillor McNeil. We have a seconder, please. Second by Councillor McLeod. All in favor? Contrary minded. Motions carried. The agenda has been approved. So this afternoon, we're very pleased to have. Warden Amanda Mumberkett and Mayor uh, from Richmond County and Mayor Brenda Beaton Chisholm, town of Port Hawkesbury. Welcome to our council. It's great to see you. And um, this afternoon, they are going to do a presentation on the Wind Task Force. And we're going to turn it over to, to Amanda or Brenda. I'm not sure. So your green button means you're. <laughs> There we go, we got it. What is this game? <laughs> it's green, it's red. Oh, is it just gonna flash back and forth? It's flashing, it's not seeing. Okay. <laughs> oh, it's yeah. not steady green. Can you hear me okay? Well, we can, it's just, it's, we it's can just hear okay. It's just uh, it is steady green so they can hear you online. If it's not okay. Green, so it's just blinking red every once in a while. We'll just give us one minute and we'll get it. Sure, a, no problem. There's they're <laughs> battery operated and periodically. Every time I go to it turns red and go to press the button. Oh yeah, it's oh. so see the red just flips yeah. up. Yeah, I'll just change it. Sorry. No problem. So okay, if it's so green, you're good to go. Same thing. It's doing the same thing. Okay. It must be maybe we're throwing off weird. some anti-technology vibes or something. Step away from the <laughs> <laughs> we should have demagnetized ourselves this morning. <laughs> okay, great. You're good okay. to go. It'll run out. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Um, so I guess before we start, just a quick introduction. I'm Mayor Brenda Chisholm Beaton, um, co-chair of the Strait of Cancel Offshore Wind Task Force. Happy to be here today. Hand things over to Amanda. Yep. Yeah. And I'm Amanda Mumberkett. So thanks for the intro earlier. I co-chair the task force with Mayor Brenda. We're really excited to be here today and want to also introduce uh, Tyler, a couple members of your team, Tyler. Can you go ahead, sure. Tyler? Thank you, uh, I'm not a stranger here, so good to see everybody. Um, Tyler Mathis, President and CEO of the Cape Breton uh, Regional Enterprise. And, uh, and It's green. Go time. All right. Time. Um, so we do have a presentation here for you today that we're going to be taking you through. I'm going to be starting and then I'll hand things off to Amanda and Amanda will hand things off to Tyler. Um, so first and foremost, the task force, we, we definitely have um, some goals as, ta as a task force and our mission is first and foremost to learn. Um, part of being here today is the engagement part and, of course, to educate both ourselves and uh, the communities for which we uh, are part of and represent. Research uh, the opportunities around offshore wind and green hydrogen 
and also to communicate uh, with each other in all of our surrounding communities and also to promote best practice. So what's happening in other places in the world around uh, offshore wind and, and green hydrogen. And as you can see in some of these uh, pictures, uh, a part of our, our journey, um, in two of the pictures, you can see uh, we took a learning tour of the Strait of Canso uh, with task force members, uh, members of the Mi'kmaq community, as well as provincial representatives. And also we've been working closely with FORCE uh, in Parisboro. We took a, a trip there just to try to understand what they were doing, uh, visiting their interpretive center and taking a look at their testing sites as well in terms of their, their adventures in hydro uh, green energy. So yeah, in title. Okay, so who we are and who we engage. So as you can see, uh, from the first uh, grouping, um, all levels of government. So we represent municipal, of course, but we also um, have active participants uh, on from the provincial government. And I won't go through this uh, in detail. You all have a copy of the presentation. Um, and the federal government representatives that we've engaged with. And you'll see little TFs next to some of the, the uh, listings that, that represents either one or more members on our actual task force. Uh, and of course, First Nation communities and fishers. We, have, we also work with Tyler at the, at the Cape Breton Partnership and, and of course, NSBI, Strait Area Chamber of Commerce, um, training and research representatives, um, Amanda wears kind of two hats, mm -hmm. so uh, with NSCC Straight Area Campus and um, as the innovation lead, um, also with FORCE and uh, AGAR uh, via Scott Burkhart, um, who works internationally but has roots uh, in Richmond County, uh, so he's a great connect for the task force, and of course plenty of industry representatives as well. And of course, I can't say enough um, about the Strait of Canso and our comparative advantages in the Strait of Canso. Um, so there's multiple factors that combine to make the Strait of Canso a very sought after location for large scale hydrogen production and export. Um, we've had significant uh, investment uh, up, to date, up to this point in time. Um, on the green hydrogen side of things. And in terms of natural attributes, of course, there's, there's uh, an abundance of wind that rivals uh, some of the best in the world. Water, an abundance of water uh, in large quantities. We have also lots of greenfield and brownfield sites in the Strait. Uh, and of course, the Strait of Canso is a deep water ice-free uh, port that is largely underutilized at this point in time, which is a huge opportunity. Um, and of course, geography, are um, I guess our proximity uh, to uh, key markets uh, is a huge um, comparative advantage. And of course, we do need to build up some capacity and scale up, but we already we have significant built strengths like supply chain. Um, we, we have a uh, workforce. Um, so our workforce as well has a lot of transferable skills uh, to be able to work with um, in the green hydrogen sector and offshore wind port services, as well as our power grid and our, the decommissioned pipeline um, is also uh, something that can be used for the offshore wind as a cable conduit. And maybe I'll just add to uh, Mayor Brenda that, you know, obviously some of these built strengths are because of our, uh, you know, our supply uh, of uh, natural gas, which was, um, you know, part of the Sable Offshore project. And, uh, and I think that's left us with some great legacy pieces that we can now kind of turn away from fossil fuels into more exactly. of a clean fuels future. So. Absolutely. And this basically, that was a great segue. <laughs> so, so as we see with the energy paradigm shift, um, Amanda's absolutely correct. Um, you see a huge transition away from coal and other fossil fuels um, towards a much uh, greener, more sustainable energy source. Um, so as you can see, uh, just as of 2019, how that transition has, has transpired here. Um, and uh, renewables are really kind of uh, you know, taking more of a forefront. And so I would invite you, uh, if you are feeling uh, curious uh, afterwards, there's, there's two websites here. Um, the dnb.com and the rmi.org. 
Um, really, this is kind of giving us a bit of a, a snapshot in terms of how green hydrogen um, is really going to contribute to our goals to be net zero. Um, and certainly, so global wind capacity dedicated to hydrogen production, um, as you can see, uh, it, the for, it's forecasted to um, certainly have tremendous growth as of 2050. Um, with regard to offshore fixed and offshore floating and onshore wind. And um, yeah, I guess I'm, so also, yeah. And again, like the green hydrogen uh, is certainly going to, to be one of the, the ways that we, we get to, uh, I guess, a global uh, net zero to be able to reach our goals. And of course, um, as you can see with the, the highlights in pink, um, this is where the world's best wind resources lie. Um, so as you can see, uh, Nova Scotia is, you know, right smack dab in the middle of being one of the world's best wind resources. I don't think there's anything more we could say about that. <laughs> just a little bit of a braggy slide. And here's yeah. another braggy kind of a slide. Um, so Nova Scotia definitely stands out as exceptional. So uh, in terms, uh, so Nova Scotia offers one of the world's most competitive untapped offshore wind resources. So it's currently a stranded resource, but as um, the green energy, um, the hydrogen, uh, as well as offshore wind uh, grows uh, as an emerging industry, We'll be able to unstrand that that wind and, and really um, you know build a wonderful resource and uh, sector here. Um, and as you can see here on the the chart, like Nova Scotia is like for um, offshore wind speeds, uh, it's like phenomenal. And you know, little Nova Scotia in comparison to like countries and huge regions, like it's pretty significant. Definitely something to brag about. Okay, next slide. Um, so we also have uh, unlimited expansion potential with, and there is this, another slide coming up that kind of shows a little bit of what's the difference between fixed bottom, shallow floating and um, deep floating uh, offshore wind. So it does, it holds a globally significant capacity of fixed bottom and floating wind. Um, so the potential is absolutely tremendous. So as you can see, again, like the last slide in comparison to uh, major regions and also countries, you know, Nova Scotia is very well positioned to be able to take part in this emerging industry. And this is a map that shows the capacity or the potential capacity for um, here's uh, for fixed bottom offshore wind, uh, 162 gig gigawatts. And um, in terms of floating, obviously much more real estate <laughs> to be able um, to, to participate or to have floating offshore wind um, to the tune of 776 uh, gigawatts of, of potential. And I just maybe will add a little comment sure. about this slide because it is showing our technical potential for both um, near shore and offshore areas. There's never going to be a time when we're going to tap into all of that. No, world, you know, um, but but what we're demonstrating at this point is this is the technical potential. We're third in the world overall um, and putting this in context, you know, when we start to talk a little bit of over, you know, a little bit over 900 gigawatts of power. Nova Scotia uses about 3.2 gigawatts of power. Mm -hmm. right now. So, so there, you know, I think there's lots of opportunity for um, for export, but I think we also want to pay attention to our domestic opportunities as well. So. Yeah. Absolutely. And this just gives you a little bit of an idea of the base configuration and scale. So um, I guess as of 1991, they were making turbines, you know, uh, you know, a certain size. And as time goes on, uh, right now in 2023, you can see it. Um, it's almost as tall as the Eiffel Tower. So mm -hmm. yeah, there as they and of course that helps with costing as well and, and making and creating efficiencies in uh, in uh, wind energy. And over um, on this side, you can see like these are the different kind of styles of uh, we've got fixed bottom and we've got also floating. So there's different types of of configurations that could be used. Mm -hmm. And I think. 
Yeah, and I think, you know, I think the, the one thing I would mention about this, because it does look start to look very big and, and scary, you yeah. know, uh, when you start to see wind turbines the size of the Eiffel Tower and, and uh, you know, research going into turbines that are bigger yet in places like China, certainly. Um, at the end of the day, like I said, uh, we are we are measuring technical potential at this stage of the game. Um, Nova Scotia is one of the few areas in the world where there is capacity for both fixed bottom and floating offshore. Um, but things we need to keep in mind are, you know, the you know, things like the fishing community and, you know, their need to be able to understand how these structures will affect their gear. So really, you know, when you think about that, it kind of comes back to one of our guiding principles since day one mm -hmm. is that uh, has been that we want to pursue a responsible and inclusive sharing of our ocean and wind resource. Um, we do not want to be going down a road where one is at the detriment of the other. Um, and so that's why we are always looking for more people to be at the table. Um, and so we do have some, you know, we do have some fishers represented there now, uh, always looking for more um, and, and to be constantly increasing our, our diversity because we need their, we need their concerns at the table. You know, our concern is that if we're not, if we're not sort of setting the direction on this industry, it will be set for us. Mm -hmm. So our, our you know, tactic has been to try to engage as many people as possible and make sure that we have strong credibility with all levels of government who will be making final decisions on these kinds of things so that they're hearing the concerns on the ground, particularly in rural Nova Scotia. Um, so that kind of segues well into a, a little bit of our next uh, our next kind of topic uh, related to uh, offshore wind and hydrogen and the two really do go hand in hand. So, you know, when we look at uh, European markets, they're looking for access to green hydrogen for the purposes of energy. Um, well, in order for it to be green, it has to be produced from a renewable resource. So it can't be, uh, you know, LNG to hydrogen. It's got to be something like wind to hydrogen. Um, and what that will enable us to do is, you know, is really look at um, number one, creating uh, off, you know, uh, green hydrogen and e-fuels here locally. We know we have multiple developers currently in the Strait of Cancer who have invested heavily in the region to do just that, to start producing hydrogen, ammonia, et cetera. Uh, we are relatively close to the European Union, which, you know, which has stated they need this uh, fuel in large uh, quantities for sure. Um, and so we have a bit of an advantage there. But I think it's, you know, although we have a limited ability right now for domestic use, I think there is a huge opportunity there, um, especially with ammonia, which is used primarily in agriculture and, and for industrial uses. So, um, so I think we need to be paying attention to growing our domestic market uh, because that makes, that makes environmental sense. Um, and it makes economic sense, um, but we also have an immediate export opportunity to look at as well. Um, so when we look at the economic development benefits, attracting green heavy industry, um, such as green steel production, certainly Cape Breton Island has a long history of steel production and it would be great to see those kinds of manufacturing businesses um, return and expand here uh, because of the access, the proximity to uh, large quantities of wind energy and, uh, and hydrogen production. Um, so really, you know, companies are going to be attracted to low cost electrons uh, because, you know, as we have learned is the cost of energy is a, it's a determining factor in a business's ab ab ability to be successful or not in many cases. Um, so we're very excited about attracting new, new heavier industries here that could be attracted by the green energy. Um, and then of course, electricity export to the USA, I would say to the EU as well. Um, there's a high, you know, there's a high opportunity there for us specifically on the electrons side of things uh, with the electricity because we have, a, we have, you know, grid connection. Um, and, you know, Nova Scotia is in a, or Cape Breton Island, I would say, is in a, is in a, envious position, I think, to other, you know, compared to other locations, because we have been powering Nova Scotia for a lot of years, decades, decades and decades, right? Uh, it's over 70 decades, or seven decades. So, you know, we have, a, we have the experience and we have infrastructure in place now that gives us a bit of a head start. Lots of work still to be done on more grid infrastructure and, and transmission, um, but, but we do have a little bit of a head start there. I might just build on that too yeah. with the electric, electricity exports of the US, uh, not only electricity, but even as a, we build out a supply chain and we touched right. on that earlier, um, but with the American uh, offshore wind um, regulatory regime somewhat ahead of our own, 
Uh, they are often in, in interest and in need of, of Canadian expertise and Canadian ports to uh, comply with their own Jones Act, which just doesn't allow international vessels to go to the U.S. ports. U.S. Mm -hmm. port. So as we're definitely eyes on the prize, which uh, is to develop a, our own heavy industry and our own uh, value chain that isn't just importing expertise and importing everything, but actually creating value ourselves. In the interim, this provides an opportunity for this uh, industry. And that's not just from the words of the task force as a group, it's from individual companies that are seeing both opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. Um, and so just this is a quick little look at hydrogen demand by sector and just trying to keep an eye on our time here. I realize we might be a little over. So, um, you know, you're seeing a lot of use in, uh, you know, refineries with ammonia production all the way up to sort of road maritime uh, infrastructure. And certainly from the NSCC's perspective with the Nautical Institute, something we're very interested in is making sure that our trainees, our, our marine students are going to be able to be, you know, to be prepared to work on vessels that are powered by hydrogen or ammonia, et cetera, et cetera. And those technologies are already developing. They're already developed. There are vessels at sea using those clean fuels now. Um, about about 80 percent, I think, of the hydrogen production today is used to manufacture ammonia, which, as I mentioned, would be for agricultural and uh, industrial use. So just a huge, huge opportunity there. Um, and you know this just really speaks to the plan. It's a it's a little uh, clip from a Nova, from a CBC article that Nova Scotia has launched an ambitious plan. And so, back in November 2021, when government was the provincial government really hadn't, um, I guess, uh, grasped uh, a hold of this offshore wind potential, the task force uh, as a group we were out there pushing the envelope on it, making sure that um, our representatives were aware of the opportunity. Um, and it was, uh, was with great joy that we heard Minister Russian announce at um, Marine Renewables Conference uh, in, you know, in November 2021 that Nova Scotia was going to be actively exploring this opportunity for offshore wind. And then in such a short period of time, less than a year later, here we were uh, gathered again at Cove, where the Premier announced a target to offer leases for five gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030. So this was a huge, uh, a huge win for the task force, I think, but a huge win for Nova Scotia, um, because it took months of lobbying, but not nearly as many months as what we thought it was going to take. So Absolutely. we're pretty, pretty proud of that effort and pretty proud that the Nova Scotia government uh, realized the opportunity as well. So just a couple of uh, notes on our value proposition. You know, we've talked a little bit about, you know, we have lot, large scale offshore wind potential, which is being widely recognized by industry. Um, it's competitive because of the speed, that 10 megabytes per, uh, the wind speed, sorry, and, and the seabed, but also our water depth and yeah. local capacity, as I mentioned. Um, our energy resources in the past have been stranded trying to get natural gas or oil to tidal waters. Well, the wind is already here at tidal water, right? So we are, uh, you know, we are ready to, ready to move forward and even scale up domestic. Um, I think some key messages from this presentation um, that again, this wind is, it's not stranded. It's an energy that is no longer stranded, that it's the value is being recognized by global investors who are, and I think the word here is racing, and I would, I would absolutely say that's an accurate word. The speed at which these projects are advancing is uh, astonishing, um, very specifically in the straight area. Um, also that this, you know, this work is not just about, the, it's not about the next big boom. This is a, an economic, a climate, and a geopolitical imperative that we're resolving. Here, you know, when we look at what's happening in Ukraine, um, when we look at, you know, energy producers from, you know, where energy is not produced, maybe in ethical ways um, or or moral ways, or by or by, you know, governments who who embrace the kind of values that we have, we, we I think we have a responsibility here. And of course, um, you know, from an economic and a climate perspective, moving away from fossil fuels has been something we've all been talking about for a very long time. So I won't get too much into this. Um, it just kind of looks at the export uh, project anatomy and it tucks, you know, you'll see vessels here, you'll see uh, green ammonia production, you'll see ammonium, uh, the ammonia plant, you'll see the, the, the influx right from the wind at the top um, and, and all of the pieces that can kind of come out of it. But the, the, you know, the purpose of this slide is to really demonstrate that we do have a technical capacity here for a phased approach to development of these projects. Um, and that there are industrial sites along the Strait of Canso and other suitable areas that are being explored now and will be in the future. 
Um, again, that domestic role, uh, we're, we're definitely pushing an export message, but this is, you know, this could be also transformative for Nova Scotians um, based on the amount of, you know, gigawatts that we use now, I think, to the, uh, you know, some of the infrastructure that we have in more urban areas is, well, frankly, newer uh, than it is in, in some other areas and more able to handle hydrogen and other clean fuels. Um, yeah, so I won't get too much into that, but just a little bit on, and I'm not sure, Tyler, where you wanted to pick up, just maybe in the next couple of slides, but just offshore wind, I think, needs to be considered for two end-use scenarios, one for electrons and the other for molecules, and that really uh, determines how our routes to market will be determined, so the U.S. electricity demand we talked about, um, but then we've also talked about exporting to, uh, to Europe as well, and predominantly right now, the interest is in power to X route to market via molecules, which is that hydrogen production you're hearing about now. Um, so just very briefly on the map, um, as you've no doubt seen in the in the news, um, Canada people are coming to Canada looking for uh, energy as they have for a long time. And increasingly, um, the Canada's message has been, yes, we have energy now, but we also have energy for the future. And that's always been a talk about hydrogen. Uh, increasingly, as ports on our West Coast have been congested, as you saw during COVID, they have not completely decongested and definitely seeing uh, East Coast ports as being a primary driver for export positioning the Strait and, and other ports, but the Strait in particular being an underutilized and deep water port uh, as an opportunity for exporting globally. Um, we'll, we'll just, that's the basic message. You can go into the details on that slide, but definitely Canada's hydrogen uh, vision is really just moving forward to a, a place where we can produce hydrogen, consume hydrogen and export hydrogen. Wow but back, uh, backed up by, by green hydrogen. Our, our counterparts in this, in this country, definitely uh, building a blue hydrogen economy in other parts of, of, of Alberta, but at a, a distinct disadvantage is being um, uh, connected to the natural gas supply in that, in that region. And as mentioned before, the, the constant struggle of having uh, an energy corridor across this country has been thwarted by other, by other interests. In this case, we can produce it here, we can export it here. Um, and I would argue that though blue and, and green matter a lot in marketing and matter in climate change, they burn the very same. And so as we build a, an economy that grows on hydrogen, this, this is suitable for both parts of our, of our region. Um, so, I, and at the end, I think these, these, these declarations of intent are, are important. Um, we've, we've mentioned a few times geopolitical, but with, uh, with the German chancellor coming here and, and of course uh, for, for, Unfortunate from our perspective that he uh, went to Newfoundland. Uh, his his goal is to have a supply of green and green energy for Canada, and certainly um, in many in, in many ways, perhaps most ways, we're a better position in Cape Breton to be that supply than it is uh, in Newfoundland. Um, and similarly, we're seeing uh, Japanese interest. We're seeing much interest in in this moving forward, and I think we're going to continue to see this. Uh, lastly, on the agriculture, definitely with um, with Russia and Ukraine at odds. Uh, the world supply of, of ammonia has, has, has dried up. And so increasingly a combination of our ability to produce it with hydrogen, our ability to export to places like Brazil, which were traditionally um, sourced by Russian or Ukrainian um, uh, fertilizers. Uh, and the fact that we already have uh, one of the world's largest fertilizer export regimes already through Saskatchewan that's, that's uh, heading out east. These are all great ways for us to take, take advantage of this. And it shows that this is an emerging industry that's not single-mindedly on one particular option, but has a broad uh, base to, to grow forward. And not just for one part of our, of our island here, but for the whole, whole island. And we think it's a great way to grow our economy, grow our population, and uh, grow other industries along with it uh, moving forward. Okay. So, yeah, we'll end, I guess, with this slide. Just a couple of foundations for <coughs> success um, is really that, you know, existing institutions and regulations need to be oriented for offshore leasing and resource development. We need to be paying attention to our port infrastructure and commercial and maritime sector. And of course, um, we, are, we are so fortunate to have a stable democracy and regulatory frameworks and the ability to develop new regulatory frameworks uh, in a stable environment, which makes us, I think, a globally preferred partner. So. I think yeah. on that note, any questions? Thank you, we. And I, I guess I'll premise your questions with the fact that we just, uh, we didn't, we came uh, with an ask, of course, and we would hope that Victoria County Council would consider um, perhaps 
designating uh, one of your council or somebody from the community, one or more, uh, to sit on the task force uh, and to continue because we do still have a significant runway um, as this, this uh, industry continues to its emerging and um, you know, growing roots. Uh, as a task force, we really want to best understand um, this opportunity so that we could fulsomely participate with this emerging industry and best position our communities to best benefit from it um, in a sustainable way, in an environmentally responsible way, um, but also in, to maximize the economic development potential for our communities as well. All of the things, all of Great. the check boxes that we want to Great presentation. No, and I just before we open it to questions, what we will do about having a representative later on this afternoon, we'll have the conversation Absolutely. rather than <clears throat> so we'll get back to you in the next yeah. couple of days, so to speak, whether it be a member of council or a member Absolutely. of the community. But uh, we just leave that with us and we'll. So I, I do, uh, we, we're just going to change up uh, how we're um, going to open it up to questions and rather than ask individuals, is there anybody on this side of the table? If you just put your hand up so we can keep track of you. Anybody here have a question, Paul? Councilor McNeil? Go ahead, turn your mic on, please, Council. No, thank you for the presentation and the excellent presentation. I've, I've seen it a couple of times. <laughs> you oh, have, yeah. <laughs> I've seen it a couple of times. Well, everybody's, every time they have to warn me about my pain. Uh, just with the electrical part of the presentation, the monkey kind of in the room is Nova Scotia Power. Are they involved in in the task force? And uh, like it's basically their grid, and uh, like they've invested millions, billions of dollars in Muskrat Falls. Are they willing to put any dollars towards this task? Yeah. So so there's a short and a long answer to that, and I'm going to start off with the longer, maybe the longer one, and it's it's that um, really when it comes down to uh, Nova Scotia Power's investment in making these projects a reality, a lot of that discussion is going to happen at a provincial level, right? Um, so it will be sort of between the province developers and NSP when it comes to determining, okay, well, do we need a, you know, a transmission study do we like what what are the pieces that we need to be putting in place here so have they been uh, pro, you know engaged with the task force so far not so much because really i think their role is going to come um, it's going it's going to come on on the other side uh, you know pr our primary reason for being is on that advocacy education research you know making sure that the community is not left behind um, in in all of the discussions so i i do think it's coming um, but i think maybe we're certainly not there uh, and i don't know that that is that would necessarily be our place it would have to be something that the, the province would probably be working on but but it is a great question because there will absolutely need to be uh, capital projects and infrastructure on their end to make this work. Councillor McDonald has a question. It's a lot of information. I know. <laughs> Great presentation. <laughs> just threw that all at you. Right <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering if there's any specific areas or targets that the task force is aware of that they're looking at. Like, like Victoria County is a pretty broad, broad area of offshore, right? Is there more up to the northern tip or is it? Yeah, so back to our map, back to our map. <laughs> And, and secondly, just to add to that question, I'm just wondering what specific individual would you, would you be looking for to join the task force? If that, if that yeah, makes sense. So, so I can tell you, like I'm just kind of bringing our maps back up here. So there has more been talk along this, you know, the Eastern kind of shore, right? So sort of Shadabakdo Bay and out into, you know, what we've been talking about is really that Eastern, Eastern side. Um, that being said, you know, it will be in part up to the province and developers to determine, you know, if there are offshore wind turbines to be put up, how, what that's going to look like and where they're going to go. Um, I think at the end of the day, in terms of an individual participating, we're looking for someone who will come in with sort of an open mind and an open heart and learn with us and take this journey with us. None of us is an expert in, <laughs> in offshore wind development, but what we are uh, you know, good at is making sure people are informed and that communications are happening and that we're considering, you know, we're considering the mistakes of the past. So I would suggest that the way oil and gas was rolled out in Nova Scotia, maybe we could have 
you know, hindsight's great. Maybe we could have done some things differently, like looking at decommissioning, like making sure that our indigenous communities are participating, making sure that rural Nova Scotia sees a lot more benefit than what it did. So I, for me, it's about someone coming in and wanting to participate in that process, not, not a, a technical expertise. Although if you have someone hanging around with technical expertise, then that's okay too. Yeah. <laughs> and and uh, any additional? I mean, municipal government is always a changing landscape. So I'm sure none of us read the fine print when we decided to put our name up <laughs> for election in 2020 and yeah, in 2016. Um, so yeah, so I, I think it's just about, you know, really, you know, being passionate about your community, being passionate about, you know, exploring new opportunities and, you know, yeah, Thanks. Really, Any other? Real I'm just going to go around once before. Uh, Deputy Warden, did you? You're good. I'm sorry, Councilor McLeod. Just the part of uh, communication with the communities. Right now, you start just with phase one. Uh, are you going to go with uh, different uh, districts, or is it's up to the municipality uh, for us to take that, this information to our residents? So, I'll, uh, so the, the Offshore Wind Task Force got off well before anyone else. And so it certainly has been seeding the seeds and being at uh, various organizations, private and also in, uh, in council chambers and First Nations. So it's been taking a role. And I'd say um, as we move forward, those specific engagements haven't been, haven't been determined. Mm -hmm. However, there's also other um, uh, interested parties that are doing engagement with the regulatory framework. Mm -hmm. And so the, the partnership has uh, applied for uh, and received some funding. Um, and while partnering with MyTax and with NSCC and, and Dalhousie on, on some, um, some capacity for, for doing the research initially, and we hope to continue that with applications made to the Impact Assessment Agency of Canada, which is tasked with what's called the Regional Assessment of Offshore Wind in Newfoundland and Labrador and Nova Scotia. There's a long one. Um, so what that means is that uh, they want to have community engagement. And so not only we, we've applied and the task force has been a driving force but behind that happening uh, by itself, the Net Zero Atlantic, you've probably heard in the news, has, has some mandate in that, and UNIR locally as well. So we've been in contact with all three of those uh, agencies. And so to your point, one thing we want to make sure and one thing the task force is great is that it can be a melting pot of what's going on, who's saying what to who, and make sure that we don't have three different engagement sessions at the same fire hall on three nights in one week. And so, um, you know, that's to ensure that people have an opportunity to really bring forward their concerns, um, whether they be positive uh, comments or whether they be some concerns, especially with those who are sharing the ocean. Thank you, Councillor Long, a question. I'm gonna play the devil's advocate, advocate here, um, just cause I've, there's been different conversation about wind power and, because we live in such a beautiful area and some people uh, in my district think that windmills are beautiful. You know, other people think no, not so much. Like when they're looking at the beautiful scenery, they just don't want to see a, a windmill. The other thing point that some people have raised is the what impact, when you say impact, what impact does it have on the ocean floor and all of the sea life living down there when they have a huge uh, and I mean, I'm, I'm all for green energy, but these are questions of so what does it do? I know that I had a constituent that because of the windmill and the deck here has seen stuff happen to her property, like because of it, uh, the rivers changed ways and things because of the road, I guess, that was put into it. And so there's just those kinds of concerns. And I guess that's what you're saying is going to be that you're going to look into all of that. <laughs> or someone's going to look into all of that. Well, maybe I'll just uh -huh. start by addressing that. So, I mean, any of these projects are going to have to undergo environmental impact assessments, right? And that's that's out of our out of our realm of influence, but it, it will it will be required and we're already seeing um, two of our hydrogen developers, you know, one one I think has submitted their environmental assessment. Um, another is al almost there, uh, if not already done. Um, and so then they're following those with open houses where they're describing the technology and they're describing the, you know, the, the, you know, the project so that the public has an opportunity to ask those kinds of questions. Um, the bottom line is, is that Canada is not 
Canada's not inventing anything new here. Um, we are what's going to be considered a second generation uh, to offshore wind. Um, this has been happening in places like Scotland and uh, Denmark and uh, the UK uh, for many years and has been transforming, you know, economies and, and uh, contributing to, you know, getting us off of that fossil fuel track. Are there going to be impacts? Absolutely. That's why we want to have people around the table to talk about that. It's really not going to be for the task force to figure out, to do those assessments. Those things are happening at a federal and provincial level, but we want to make sure that the, those concerns are brought forward when those assessments are, are being conducted. Do you know? So has there any, been any uh, research and uh, I'm pretty naive on this subject, but about like tidal power, because we have like such big tides. And even when I look at English town, when the, mm -hmm. the water comes in and out of the harbor there, the amount of force that it does, and if there's a way of tapping, and I know there is a way of tapping into that, but is anybody in Nova Scotia doing that kind of? So, I mean, force, force in Parsboro has been the lead, I think, in Nova Scotia for a number of years now on tidal energy. But, of course, their focus area has been on the Bay of Fundy, mm -hmm. which is, you know, extreme tidal uh, energy uh, capacity there that, you know, the challenge is how to harness it. Um, I, I can't tell you for sure if they've been looking at other areas in the Bridgewater Lake. I do believe there was a marine renewable area designated in the lake, but I'm, I would have to look up to see where it's at. It hasn't been the focus for our offshore wind folks. So. Is that it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Both locations for, yeah. Uh, Councillor McNeil, and we're in, I'm just keeping an eye on the time. So, Councillor McNeil, any question? Yeah. Yeah. And so that, so, so. <laughs> I know it's offshore, but is there a possibility of, of uh, having structures in the lake? As so well? to our knowledge, there are no developers looking at that at this okay. time. Um, and like I said, I believe that blue spot you're talking about there too was because there was a marine renewable area kind of designated there, but it, I think it was more in the kind of early days of tidal discussion. Um, maybe Tyler, you know? I, and I, yeah, to, to reiterate, these machines are quite large as, yeah, as, uh, as the board mentioned. Um, you know, often some, some characterize them as half a kilometer high, right? Once you add them all together. So they're talking um, well over uh, beyond the horizon. So if you're in the lake, you know, you, you'll be able to see it from both sides. So all the developers have been adamant. They want to be over the horizon, um, better wind resource, um, and we have a long, a long shelf. So that'd be appropriate for both fixed and floating uh, potential. And, uh, and also as noted, you know, the province, uh, announced five gigawatts they want to have permitted by 2030. Um, that's, uh, you know, in juxtaposition with the 168 gigawatt potential, right? So we're really talking there. They're looking for those places that are most technically feasible, least impact for all users. And there's a lot of sites to choose from. And I highly doubt the Bredore Lakes hit any one of those things. Well, thank you very much. Just a couple of quick comments and I just want a little clarity. Um, so from our council, or are you looking for uh, support from our municipality for the project as well? Or? Uh, participation in the discussion, I think. That would be true. So yeah. it's kind of one of the same. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I can assure you that we'll have a short conversation this afternoon and notify you as, as uh, quickly as possible. And I think there's quite a bit of interest. Obviously, it's a great project and it's a great message today. Uh, one so. person fell asleep. That's one. Well, that's great. <laughs> So, and I was watching. So I was watching. you did well. You were you, both of you were looking at council from a different perspective this today. Is Paul's, so. This is Paul's third presentation. You didn't yeah. even explain it. That is impressive. Well, I want to thank you very much, and we appreciate again uh, your attending council, both as representing this particular project and representatives from the other uh, municipalities as well. It's great to see you, and thank you very much for your time, and well done. We appreciate the the, the request to come and present. Actually, yeah, right. we're strong arming our way in but we're not usually invited <laughs> no it's our pleasure and to hear our presentation <laughs> well thank you very much thank you very much so our next item on council this afternoon you have uh
I received uh, the minutes of January 23rd, 2023. Those minutes were circulated to you. Were there any errors or omissions in those minutes? Hearing uh, no, we have a motion to approve the minutes of January 23rd, 2023, please. That's been moved by the deputy warden. And it, do we have a seconder? Second by Councilor McNeil, all in favor? Aye. Any business arising? Councilor McLeod. I have a business arising, but I have another um, another points to comment. So I, if I can put it in the district concern. Uh, sure. That will be. We can do that, not a problem. So the minutes, uh, January 23rd, have been approved. We're gonna move on to the CAO's report. Thank you. So I just wanna go over a couple of things, give you some updates on our departments. Uh, so some action items from prior council sessions. Um, there was a question on the Bedeck washrooms and if they are open, I didn't think that they were, but I have since heard that there is one uh, that at least one that they are trying to keep open uh, here in Bedeck. So just an update on that. Um, I have contacted Steve McDonald about council about attending council. So I'm awaiting a date on that uh, for him to come here. Um, you've asked to have developed Nova Scotia or build Nova Scotia come to council to talk about broadband. They will be attending in February on our February 21st session. What's that? Uh, virtually they'll be coming. Um, there was a question on garbage collection or services on municipal, or sorry, on private roads. Uh, so I've done up a document, a recommendation report and uh, a sample policy on um, garbage collection or um, municipal services that could happen on a private road. Uh, you've all been sent it. Um, my recommendation on it is that we establish this policy for private roads and municipal waste collection and recommend that uh, council will uh, adopt that private roads and municipal waste collection policy. Um, you've all received it. Uh, anyone have any thoughts on that? Uh, no, Leanne, I thought it was excellent. I, I think it's uh, what in English we're seeing a number of developments happening. Mm -hmm. And I think this answers a lot of their questions and I think would go a long ways to entice other developers to come in the area. Yeah. Um, again, I don't think uh, I still feel there's an issue when people go to do their subdivision that they're not given the information from Eastern District Planning about the roadway because everyone I talked to is under the impression that we're going to take over the road, mm. and but yet they weren't aware. And so I'm not sure we can do more on that front, but as far as the policy and, and going that far, I think that's an excellent first step. And, yeah. uh, and thanks yeah. very much for looking into that. So I'm, I'm wondering if anyone is interested in doing a recommendation to accept that policy. We have a motion to accept that recommendation, please, from the CAO. I move that we accept that recommendation as presented by the CAO. Thank you, Deputy Warden. Do we have a seconder for that, please? Sure. Second by Councilor McLeod. All in favor? Contrary minded. Motion is carried. The recommendation has been accepted. Great. So we will uh, put that policy into practice. Um, update on the comfort centers. So we had a, an ask from Lyle who was in touch with all the com comfort centers around the municipality. And we had made a recommendation that if they applied for generator funding, that we would fund, it was 11 that had applied and we would fund um, an amount of 92,625. I have an update on that. There were eight that had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight that had received funding. There was two that did not. Um, so the amount of those eight that received the 20% that we were going to uh, um, cover is 68,222. However, there were two of those eight that are included in the 68, but there was also an amount that theirs was over and above what was uh, approved for the 80%. So if we were to 
approve an amount over on those two of 24,568 plus 68,222, it would still bring us to 92,790, which is $165 over what our original amount was. But keep in mind that that original one was for 11 as comfort centers, and this is for eight. So I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that. So it still is within the amount, but it's for less comfort centers. Any questions or comments? Councilor McLeod and Councilor Longba. Is, uh, two, they have a bigger amount. Two one. have a bigger two. amount than what we had approved for the 20%. Okay. And that amount comes to, for those two, it an, would be an extra $24,568. Okay. Okay. So the, the original 20% yeah, would be 68 to 22. Okay. Councilor Longba. Uh, so the three that didn't get funding from the province, I'm assuming that is, is that correct? Where correct. the funding was? Uh, yeah. So they're not going to be comfort centers. Is that the, like what happens to them, even though they wanted to be comfort centers? No, nope, this be? was an approval of a comfort center. This was just that they didn't get uh, funding for their generators. Okay, so we're not going to give them anything towards the generators, or are they still going to go ahead and get the generators, the, the three that didn't get approved? I don't know that, mm -hmm. um, but right now I just want to deal with the funding on the generators that had that did receive the, the funding from the applications that they sent in. Those other yeah. two, three, I'm not exactly sure why they didn't. I think there was one that didn't have all the information, and the other one may not have submitted yeah, um, I just wondered if uh, we should just stay with the 20% that we had promised and then keep the other funding that we had allotted for those three that potentially are going to be comfort centers and so might need to help. So we had only approved the funding if they got contingent on them getting the, so there is no funding, mm -hmm. but it was there contingent on them receiving the other 80%. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. It's a provincial program. Yes. Yes. It's a provincial, we're a portion of the provincial fund. Yes. Councilor McNeil, any questions, please? Uh, so that one, um, the, the generator that is there had to be uh, reassembled or there was a space that had to be built onto the building or there was something about the the age of the building and the size of the building and the um, what they what was ineligible compared to eligible in the application, I believe. Yeah, I had asked Lyle why they didn't receive the twenty percent, and it was it had to do with things that were not um, part of the program. But they did receive the generator funding, but this is on top of that, probably the electrical and things to get the generator set up. And mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, I, I believe, yes. Councillor Oregon. Um, can I, is it our responsibility that they had to go over when they knew the amount that we were going to give? You could say that um, because the funding was for 80% of a uh, generator. Um, however, keep in mind the comfort centers are, are municipal um, I, I understand uh, operations. Just, you know, I'm, I just feel that yeah. eight of them could win over. Yep. I think it's a different setup for the okay. two that are over. Okay. I think the other ones may just be ready to plug in the generator that that is coming. Um, and these two had some special adaptations that had to happen. Okay. Deputy Warden. Yeah, I, I think it comes down to it. It's a provincial program and they're providing 80%. And if we can get eight comfort centers up and running, which I, I think it's money well spent and it's money we've already approved. And, and I think like Liam was saying, I know one of them in particular is electrical issues that, uh, that have to be dealt with that uh, no matter what, we're getting eight good generators and eight facilities. And uh, one of the ones that has not been approved is in my district. And so be it, but I, I don't want the other ones not to go without. I think it's very important that all everybody gets it. So uh, I, I'm in favor of it hundred uh, percent. Any other questions or comments in regards to Councillor Longa? Uh, yeah, just that 
um, the three that weren't approved, I have no idea where they are or what district that they're in, but I'm just to make sure that we have uh, comfort centers in every district, you know, so everybody has accessibility to, to a comfort station and that's uh, maybe the two that didn't get approved are in one district and then they have no comfort center would be my concern and that we didn't give them any funding. So this isn't us giving funding though, it is funding for a generator to be put into their into their spot. Any other questions? Just a quick one. If they don't qualify this year, could they, is this an annual? Could they qualify next year or is it a one-shot I'm guessing deal? that it's not. It's just a one in yeah. response to yeah. what happened. And for those, just keep in mind, um, for those that didn't receive the funding, we do have a grant application, grant uh, funding that is available. Have your applications, for, encourage them to have their applications in. Um, and for whatever reason, I don't know. It seems like they would approve it if they had everything that they needed. So um, I, I do not know why the three that didn't get it um, didn't. Um, but what we're dealing with here is the uh, eight that did. Uh, so my question is uh, the, the 68, which is the 20%, that's a no brainer because mm -hmm. we've already agreed to that. Uh, my question is on the other or the over overspend on the two is council agreement in spending that, which still falls within the original allotted amount, but it's for less comfort centers. I, I move that we spend the money. So uh, you, you're making a motion that we spend yes. that 92,000 and to be dispersed appropriately yes. as, as approved by the CAO. Yes. Okay, do we have a second for that? Second. Second by Councilor McLeod. All in favor? Any contrary? So that's been approved unanimously. Thank Perfect. you for that. Thank you. Okay, uh, they'll be very happy to hear that. Uh, so that's great. Um, our municipal boundary review, we will be having a UARB public hearing here in the courthouse on April 18th related to that. So we j I just found that today after uh, the CAO report was sent out. So just a couple of things from different departments. So in our finance department, so Alex and our team are compiling input and ideas from our planning session that just happened for next steps. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, she's also doing audit planning with Grant Thornton. I had a call with them this morning. Um, so they're, they are at the beginning of their audit planning stages. Um, we're looking to start our first budget day planning. Uh, so we need to select a day, wondering if the morning of February 21st works for everyone. Uh, which is council day and you're going to be here anyway. So we're hoping that that day would work for that. 21st, 20th is a holiday. February 20th is family day. So, yeah. Uh, so we can uh, talk about that. If that works, we'll check to see if that works um, based on some of the things that could possibly be happening, but we could fit it in, fit it in, in the morning. Um, we are doing tax sale prep, which is ongoing for our March 28th tax sale. Um, and related to our tax update, I think Alex sent a note out to everyone, but just giving an update. Um, as of Friday, we are 151,798 ahead of where we were this time last year. Um, and that is both in current and in arrears. So fantastic job by our um, revenue department downstairs. In public works, waste management, we're in the process of procuring a 2016 new to us transfer truck. Our transfer truck um, has been having some issues and um, sort of unknown, um, got away from us, but uh, is not passing um, inspection for the body of it. And so we are sourcing out a new to us 2016. Um, it's gonna be shipped from Montreal, should be in Dartmouth this week. So we're gonna to, going to go up and have a look at it. Hopefully we will have good luck with that. Uh, our former Inganish school roof tender has been posted. This will be closing February 17th. Um, we are also doing some uh, surveys for the requirements to our current leachate collection system. Um, we received a quote on the solar panels at the Bedeck transfer station. 
uh, here's a shocking number. They went from 200, they, there's a quote of 225,000 that would have been 92,000 if we would have done them three years ago. Uh, we'll be taking this to budget discussions for that. Uh, but hopefully we can share that um, savings of what this is generating um, another green uh, power source. Uh, we have a new side loader, which is on schedule for the end of March. Tomorrow, tonight and tomorrow, we'll be shutting down the water in Niels Harbor to do some leak detection down there. These uh, freezes and thaws are not good for our water systems. So I would imagine this won't be the last of this, uh, but we will be doing some work tonight and tomorrow to try and isolate it. And there will be messaging going out related to that. We're also doing messaging to our water customers related to our water rate increase, which is going to be happening um, in, on our bills in July, and we will be getting uh, messaging out on that soon. Uh, we're having a meeting with Neptune, who are our new water meter installers on February 21st. We'll be talking about the rollout of that in our tourism and recreation department and tourism. So Dan has been working with Destination Cape Breton, Tourism Nova Scotia, um, Inverness County, and with Inverness County on a cluster mapping pilot project. <laughs> for Victoria County and Inverness County. Um, so the, he'll probably give an update on that in a little um, show of it on, online about um, what it's going to look like. Uh, it'll be spatial data layers and things that probably a lot of us don't know about right now, but it's kind of interesting. Uh, he also met with Destination Cape Breton on some projects and met with Tourism Nova Scotia to continue planning the infra influencer visit to Inganish. Uh, that's going to be happening in recreation. We've signed an agreement with Bicycle Nova Scotia for certified bicycle routes. And that will be throughout the county. Um, our recreation guy has also completed class presentations and surveys of the students to gauge the interest in different forms of physical activity. And so these results will help direct future efforts for programming. Um, we have met with uh, Build Nova Scotia uh, to talk about plans, upcoming plans for the Seawall Trail. Um, I think they keep replacing whoever they had on it in Build Nova Scotia. So uh, we just had a meeting last week with the new Build Nova Scotia rep. Um, they've also had discussions in our uh, tourism recreation with Crowdis Mountain Snowmobile Club and Cabot Snowmobile Club on the current season and projects they're working on to enhance sections of the trails. And our RFPs for phase three and upgrade two will be ready to distribute soon. There will be a bidder, bidders meeting happening here in council chambers on February 27th, or February 17th at 2 p.m. Uh, he also had a BDAC Beacon Project Selection Committee meeting uh, last week, and they've started some groundwork on establishing a terms of reference and a selection process for the community-led project steering committee. In senior safety, senior safety has been doing more outreach. If you want her involved in um, coming to some of your events, please reach out to her. Um, she's looking at some funding for accessibility upgrades for the parking lot back here. And um, there's an ever increasing amount of frauds and scams that have been happening with seniors, targeting seniors, they're actually targeting everyone. Um, I'm sure you've all seen a text come in that's asking you to respond or click on it. Those are all scams. Um, if you're worried about, uh, if you're worried that you have been a victim, please contact your local RCMP uh, detachment or find more info from Canadian Anti-Fraud anti Center or the Senior Safety Department down here. Uh, and Senior Safety will also connect with any seniors who are interested to learn how to play chess. Chess with Charlie. I don't know who Charlie is, but chess with Charlie who teaches and connects players. So please contact um, senior safety related to that. So a couple of other things we're working on, ongoing discussions with Smokey about um, the development down there. Um, we are scheduling a meeting to discuss CND changes and future of shells uh, with our, uh, uh, our involvement in them. And this is a really good news story. Uh, so Lyle um, was gone last week to pick up two uh, fire trucks that were taken to the North Shore. On his way back, he had a call from somebody who had, I think, followed part of their journey. And uh, we have been offered a new to us ambulance that is in Ontario. 
and he will be arranging to go and pick that up as an MFR um, piece to add to one of our fleets for our fire departments. So if you have a fire department or if you know of a fire department that has an interest in using this as an MFR truck, please make a formal ask. So send um, an email to, uh, to Lyle and then we're gonna vet through those and we're gonna have a new, a new piece of equipment here. So really, really good, um, good news story. Yeah, and that's all I have. Any questions or comments for the CAO? Regards to a report and the information provided. Councilor McLeod, sorry, Mike on, thanks. About the public works for the roof, uh, I, I assume uh, she's checking the funding for the NSFM, right? Yep, so uh, she's looking, uh, we're always looking for um, whatever funding we can get. Yep. Um, if we do receive funding, we're still gonna have to cover a cost of it ourselves. It might be about $60,000 is our guess right now, but those okay. things are constantly, the price keeps going up on um, them, okay. uh, but we are acting on it. And so okay. um, that seems to be where we're at right now. Councilor Longa. Uh, yeah, just in regard to uh, the report Cassandra said about all the fraud things that happened, I just had an email asking, saying that I overpaid my TALUS bill and then a place to click on it. And I just thought that just doesn't seem right because usually phone companies don't give you back your money. They usually just keep it and put it towards your next bill or something. So I'm sure it's probably a fraud. It but is. I mean, so, because it was TELUS and I have, and I use TELUS, I thought, oh, well, the, I didn't click on it. Yeah. So any of those short emails mm -hmm. that give you an, uh, a, a uh, website a or a, mm -hmm. a, link, a link to click, mm -hmm. please don't click on it. I actually received one over the weekend that said your heating rebate has been approved. Uh, please. So there was a link to click. They're, they're trying to come up with lots of different ways. Um, so it's not just seniors, but um, uh, most who are trusting might be following those links. So please do not. If you have questions, please call the company. If it's not somebody that you deal with, don't click on it. Just one, just a couple of things. That the, the security training that we were offered by mm -hmm. David News, that's very good. It, it gives yeah. you those indications you're talking to counselor. And the other thing you may not be aware of, I keep getting um, emails from Scotiabank where they don't even bank. So, I mean, obviously <laughs> it's not. Uh, both Scotia Bank and the Royal Bank, you forward it to phishing, P-H-I-S-H-I-N-G, at scotiabank.com or rbc.ca, I believe. And now you won't get an answer back, but at least they're aware that you've gotten those. And I've been getting them lately from Bell Alliance too, to update my account information. And there's no need, you know, you're usually where your, your, your account will expire in like 12 hours if you don't do this right away kind of thing. And that's one of the things that's pointed out in that security training too. It's always a sense of urgency. So it's, you know, as Leanne says, just, unless you're absolutely sure, I just ignore them. And if it's legitimate, they'll get a hold of you somehow, you know, they'll find a way to do it. But uh, it is becoming more like, uh, I don't know if you're getting these, Daniel, I got one this morning from Amazon Prime. It's it's a robot. It's not a person, but I mean, he's it, almost on a free. He cones two or three times a day. Our number. So I mean, it, it's just pervasive now. It's unbelievable how, and as Leanne said, they're getting more sophisticated too in in how they're going about this, which is the scary part. <laughs> Anything else for the CAO? Just uh, want to mention that we, I'd asked, or we had asked, I, I'd asked, I should say, I'd asked to <clears throat> just go back to the uh, gentleman that gave us a quote on the building to repair and replace. And we asked for his updated figures because those are two or three years old. So he, he hasn't gotten back to us yet. So <clears throat> I can imagine those prices. We actually need to get it. He's going to prepare a quote for us. Quote. So we're not getting updated numbers. We'd have to get another quote. To, for him to tell us that the building price is skyrocketing. Well, we know where that's kind of uh, like the solar panels, 92 to 250. Um, okay, then if there are no more questions or comments for the CAO, we are going to take a 10 minute break. It is 
309. So we'll reconvene at 319. Thank you.
So we are going to reconvene council. We are going to deal with the next item on the agenda. It is district concerns and we'll start with Councillor Oregon, please. Thank you. Very Thank you. quiet uh, little while. I have no district concerns this, this evening. Thank you very much, Councillor. Uh, we'll go to uh, Councillor McNeil next door, please. To Warden, no, I have just one concern. Uh, I had a number of phone calls of unsightly premises and dumping on the Nyanza Wharf uh, Loop Road. Old cars, trailers, debris throughout the area. And now the beavers have a dam in the area, so that debris is partially underwater. I did get in touch with our, uh, our building inspector and Eastern District Planning and uh, put in a formal complaint. And they were supposed to come down on Friday to check it out, but with the, how cold it was, uh, I'd say they'd be down this week to check with the situation. So it's just an FYI for everybody. You, Councillor. Councillor McDonald, District Number Eight. Yes, sir. Thank you, Warden. Um, just a few this afternoon. Uh, first of all, I have I have three concerns I'd like to bring up. First one is I received uh, numerous calls in regard to the recent power outage that we experienced in basically in the northern part of the District Eight. There, I was lucky enough to to have my power, but the people beyond where I'm where I'm um, living at, they uh, they lost their power for upwards of six hours plus during the last storm. It was, Pretty cold as we all experienced and things like that with seniors and that but uh the power had been surging off and on and when it did come back some people had lost uh there was electronics and appliances that were dysfunctional no longer working so i i told them if uh probably best to reach out to nova scotia power for starters to see if they can put in an inquiry form or a complaint of some sort but i guess uh most people are reaching out to me and asking if we could have Nova Scotia Power come back to council. It's been a while since they've been here. And had one gentleman question said he, he was concerned with the uh, recent increase, 14% increase in rate hikes that's coming our way. I think they're implemented now, if, if that's right. First one is. Yeah. And I'd just like them to come and sit down and explain what their, the, the new, um, like with the infrastructure and what maintenance they're doing. Because it seems like every time you turn around, and I'm, I'm only speaking for, my area, the power is off, constantly going in, going in, right? So I would like to make uh, that in the form of a motion. Would you like contact and it's Nova Scotia Power to attend council? to sir? come to council to sure. uh, update us on. We uh, have a seconder for that, please. Seconded by Councillor Patterson. All in favor? Aye. Contrary minded, motion's carried. We will forward that request, sir. So my second one, both of uh, all my concerns today are, are uh, in regard of uh, electricity and, and communications, believe it or not, which are two vital things that we need in order to survive in our area. Right. Secondly, is uh, with Bell Alliant, I had a, a senior that called me saying with this, the last storm and the storm previous to that of the battery backup that they use once their landlines, the power is out, once the battery backup is depleted, then they have no use of landlines. And as we know, most seniors in my area, maybe throughout the county, they have they just use landlines, they don't have cell phones, they don't depend on cell phones, right? So it's a big concern in regard for uh, the emergency service if they need fire, police or ambulance and they're not able to call 911. So I think that, I, I remember past Councilor McGinnis had this same same uh, concern and it didn't seem there was ever a resolve that came to us, I don't think, other than that they would look into it or they were working on it. And I think it's something that I'd like to follow up on. That's actually something that had happened during Hurricane Fiona also, and they couldn't reach a lot of the uh, towers for whatever it was that they had for um, for where their power battery Generate, was. Yes. Yeah, and so that is something that EMO was actually dealing with, and that was part of a debrief that Lyle had attended Um in Halifax with provincial EMO, but it is something that uh, we can get some more information on. Yeah, and I do know outside some of the mt t buildings that there's a, I know specifically home, there's a generator in place that's non-functioning. And I think that is the job of to boost those battery packs back up. So if I could make another motion to have a uh, letter written to, 
I guess it's Bell Alliant in regard to uh, the battery backup for land lines. Okay, thank you very much. Do we have a second for that, please? Second. Second by Councillor Long. All in favor? Aye. Contrary minded. Motion's carried. Thank you, Councillor. Anything else? Yes, lastly is another one with regard to uh, communications, this time with cellular service. This is on the, the, the side that, that goes towards uh, Pleasant Bay and Big Interval. Residents of Big Interval and this side of the district line have experienced little or no cell service in the past two months when callers provide. They're told that there are no issues on their end when they call Bell Cellular and uh, they're encouraged to use Wi-Fi calling. That's if they have any type of power or signal. But really this day and age, that is, that's just ridiculous. There's, there's no need of that. I was in conversation with the owner of uh, Maple Ridge Cabins who explains the service is terrible and he has had numerous Bell representatives that he's spoken to and he's getting, just getting the run around. He's not getting any results whatsoever. And the internet is uh, non-functional in that area. And he has a, a business that he's operating out of there since two years now with uh, cottages. And it's, it's a beautiful part of the district of that area. And he's had many, um, many people who have canceled bookings from out of town in the Halifax area due to the, not having availability of internet. And, um, so again, like, you know, it's just people are not taking the seriousness of this nature. It's like specifically for emergency services in general, right? So I think it's time that these big corporations or representatives have to uh, have to be more transparent with their, you know, other than just writing a note saying that they're working on it or something like that. So I guess this third motion would be for Bell Cellular, trying to keep track of all the different Bells. There's Bell Line, Bell Cellular, and... Oh, so if I could make this a third motion, sure can. Uh, have, so I, I think we got the gist. We got the gist. Mobility, Steph, correct? Steph says that she's got the gist of the motion or the okay. intent of the motion. <laughs> Thank you. Well done. So <laughs> three motions is my limit. How did he? How did he do? He did well. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I really think they should, if they could. You know, I know they won't come, but yeah. the, who are the folks that are coming by virtual? Is that for? That's, that's just for broadband, is it? It's not cell yeah. service. <clears throat> so we we can change the request to write a letter to them to attend council for correct address the concerns, particularly addressed by you and other councillors. Please. We, we need a second over that. You're seconding, seconded by Councillor McNeil. Thank you. At one time, there used to be a liaison, or like Dave, uh, Dave Hashin, or uh, Kevin, Kevin Hashin, and he used to come to council every, like every year. Anyway, at least he'd get an update. Now we haven't had anybody probably in about eight years from along. What was he, Bell? He was Bell, Bell Alliant. Alliant. He was Alliant. He was Alliant. Yeah. He was yeah. Alliant. But like he's he was taken away from the that job. I don't know. I don't think there's anybody now. The closest individual I have contact with now is from Newfoundland. Robinson by Newfoundland. Newfoundland. Yeah. So we'll maybe what we'll do is ask the CAO to track down who is the local area representative for cell service i'll do my best <laughs> <laughs> yeah. perfect okay okay both of you will provide so that was moved and seconded all in favor no further discussion thank you anything else councillor yes just lastly uh, in regard to public works um once again i as the ceo had stated she was waiting for a uh response from Mr. McDonald in regard to coming to council. I think it's important that that Mr. McDonald comes to council so that everybody virtually can hear from the department and what they're uh, with the inventory. I've had uh, numerous people calling with the this past storm again. It seems like it's always a storm. We've been pretty lucky with the weather thus far, but I did receive an email in regard to saying that I inquired initially about a specific piece of equipment that was moved out of District 8 that went in an ish. The response that I got was that a new piece of equipment was given to the district, which 
I, I've yet to seen it. I don't know where it's at or where it's, if it's hiding somewhere behind the building, but I can't find it. But I've sent those concerns off to MLA Bing and uh, also to Mr. McDonald for, uh, and as Deputy Warden had stated a couple of days back there, I am now encouraging people to contact Steve McDonald directly by email and their MLA with district concerns with public works. And to be fair, uh, Steve did contact me back after I approached him and he said that, that he was going to reach out to the others that we had asked um, to have come with him. And so he was trying to schedule a meeting with all of them. So I did and, hear and back. He did, him, but and he did write on. me back. I should state that as well. So that's it for District 8. Thank you very much, Councillor. Councillor Long, District number four. Um, see, I'd like to take $300 from my district budget for the Bedeck Women's Curling Bonds Field. I understand that uh, you and Councillor McLeod both have given $300 as well. So I'm happy to contribute to that. Um, I was asked by um, um, someone why I voted for the funding that was requested by the Tory Highland uh, Civic Center, and I'd like to answer that. Um, I voted because I felt uh, we needed a facility for recreation in the area. We, have, we do have school hockey team, we have women's hockey, we have, uh, and I feel it's not only hockey, it's figure skating, speed skating, power skating, family skating, and just a place for people to come together and socialize. Uh, there is an annual tournament that's called the Stephen McDermott Tournament. He played, coached, and refed hockey, and his son continues uh, his father's legacy. They're both from my district. I also had three sons in hockey in Bedeck at one time. So that's why I voted. But that being said, I hope that the new build will be built on a location big enough to include the other groups that also need infrastructure and that the whole process will be inclusive to the community input and involvement that they'll work together and potentially build in phases starting with the new rink. Um, and I'd also like to thank the 50 plus constituents who answered uh, the questions I sent out regarding the strategic planning session that was held February 1st and 2nd. Um, and I will be giving feedback from that session at the seniors luncheon on Wednesday in Indian Brook at 11 o'clock. And that's it from District 4. Very good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Patterson. From uh, Councilor McDonald's uh, concerns, the, the concern we had in Bulletry was um, blips, I called them. I don't know, I guess there's a technical name for them. But at 11 o'clock on Friday night, I was sitting watching television and the power went out. So the, my first instinct was to panic because the water would have froze probably within an hour because that's all, I have no other heat. Uh, you come back on. They had continued to blip between four to five to six seconds off and then on again, maybe for five minutes, maybe for 10 minutes, maybe for 20 minutes until 11 o'clock Saturday. So that was the most, uh, some people had, didn't lose power at all, even in Black Rock in, in Big Bedore, they had power the whole time. So anyway, to conclude the story, I went down, uh, took a drive down the road on Saturday afternoon and there was a Nova Scotia power truck parked on the, on the shoulder and the young fellow in. So I stopped and talked to him. I said, uh, I, I told him my situation where the power was doing. Yeah, I said, we know, we have no idea what it caused. And he said, he said, I'm here watching these two branches hitting the line. He said, and they're going, going to fire, but they're not the main problem. He said, so, um, there was a spokesman on the radio this morning who apologized. So that in a dollar fifty will get you a coffee at Tim's. But uh, he did say that there were equipment issues, and that's what this young fellow thought it was too. So uh, as, as Councillor McDonald said, you know, we'd like to see them come to council uh, so we can ask them uh, what this problem was and if they are working on solutions. Uh, a neighbor of mine has a daughter in Thompson, Manitoba, and she was talking to her. And one of the reasons given uh, was the temperature, the cold. It was minus 52 where she was in northern Manitoba, and they didn't lose their power. <laughs> so, uh, you know, again, the Councillor McDonald said if they would come and, and talk to us and uh, 
explain what they're doing to improve the situation. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor. We're going to move on to the Deputy Warden. Daphne, please. Uh, thank you, Warden. Uh, no issues. Everything's been looked after through either Public Works or uh, our MLA, so things are moving. Um, with power, I just want to say how lucky we were in District 6 that we kept our power because I've never seen wind like that Saturday night that we had. So uh, some of the infrastructure is holding up and others is not. So let's hope we get a good answer from them. But uh, for today, we're good. Thank you. Thank you. District number two, Councillor McLeod. <clears throat> Uh, just want to, I have four concerns from uh, Mr. Harvey. Uh, as you know, in January 24, she sent an email with a letter to you guys. So um, the first one, it go with another three. Uh, in January 20, in January 9, uh, Councilor Lova was saying about uh, some uh, residents were concerned about the project of Victoria Highland Community Center. And I stayed, I didn't have any concerns in my district. So I make a mistake. Uh, I received two concerns, uh, Mr. Harvey and Mr. King regarding about the Victoria Highland Civic Center. So I just want to put it in the minutes. Uh, was, and then um, I received some emails from uh, Mr. Harvey, uh, Mr. Kerr too, he's here present. Um, so, and I called them after to tell them it was a mistake. I was going to put in the minutes today. The second one, uh, Mr. Harvey, as you know, the letter, uh, she, he's asking for some answers of council discussion. Um, the first one is, one is about uh, the conduct of the Warden Morrison, uh, what to be advocate for the proposal. Uh, he gave ample time to the committee to make the presentation. Um, Mr. Morrison cut off urging away the public who have opposing opinions on ideas. Uh, a chair or moderator must remain neutral and ensure there is order. Uh, Mr. Morrison appeared to be prejudiced and gave one side ample time. So uh, they want to put it there. So it's, uh, she requests the word and prejudice of the January 9 meeting on council be table and discussed by council as an agenda item the next meeting council. So if any discussion you have or any answers, uh, it's time to clarify. I'd like to make a comment. Um, I thought the warden did an excellent job that day. Uh, it was not our issue. Um, he was trying to keep order and moved on. We could have spent all day here. And as a councilor from North, it's really not as of interest to me as it is. It's probably for in the Bedeck area, but I felt the warden did an excellent job that day, keeping control of everything and making sure everyone had a chance to talk. Uh, at the end of it, they were asked if there was any more questions and there was none. And they were also given the opportunity to talk elsewhere because it was not our issue. Yeah. So uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, maybe the only problem I see with the warden is too respectful at times. <laughs> Thank you very much. Anybody else? I have said more. Okay. What I oh. questions? Okay. No, okay. So the second is uh, the, council, the council needs to answer why they have opted to provide this sort of money to a project with no contingencies. Uh, example, example, why were there no conditions such as openness, transparency, public engagement attached to this commitment of our money? Please ensure this is discussed in the next council meeting and ensure the discussion or resolution is part of the minutes. Any discussion? Any answer? Well, I, I have to agree with that, that we didn't ask for any kind of financial papers. I never seen any finances. I'll argue that we did. Uh, we, we haven't spent a cent on this yet. No. What we did say was that uh, our money was contingent on other funding being received by federal and provincial. So there were contingencies on it. We did look for that. With that, we, we said right from the very beginning that we weren't going to be a recreation facility poor county. Right from the first meeting we had, I said that. And uh, we, we had the opportunity to, to give $1 million towards this project that could, at initially was $14 million, now it's $25 million, that we possibly could have our offices there. Uh, we, we would look into having our offices there. Uh, we didn't commit to it or anything, but it, it was 
like I think it was a, a commitment that we could put forward towards this building. And if we didn't have a rink in this facility, we'd be going backwards as a county. And I said that right from the beginning too. So, thank you. Okay. Now, I, I just also want to comment. Um, again, this is a Bedeck issue. It's not a county issue, okay? If you talk to the councilors north, we drive two to three hours to get anywhere. And here in Bedeck, you can drive 25 minutes pretty we get any facility you want. So that's what it is. Um, now I'm trying to remember where I was going with this. The, um, the, the thing with the, the rink coming here is that the, the village of Bedeck should be stepping up. Uh, they're the ones that it's responsible for it. Uh, like I say, down north, it, it doesn't have anything. But again, if I have the opportunity to see 14 or 20 or $30 million come into this county, and it's going to cost us $1 million, I'm not going to say no to it. It's a very good investment on part of the county. And also, you had a group of people that recognize the problem in their community, and I give them credit for it. They put together a great proposal, and they put a lot of work into it. And again, these guys are volunteers. Uh, you know, if, if it's a perfect or not perfect, I, I don't know. But anyway, they were the volunteers. They put the work into it. They came to council and did a great presentation, and they were rewarded with the money. And I offer everyone else who wants to do the same thing, they can do the same thing. But again, it's $1 million that's going to, if it's successful, will bring 23, I don't know what it is, million into this county. And I think it's a good move on the county's part. Any other district concerns? Uh, Any other comments? And the last one, um, he's saying, um, I request to have full disclosure of any member of council who has sat on the steering committee, new ring or new ring committee. Uh, just so I can say we, Sit down, uh, Councillor uh, McNeil, Councillor Longwa, um, Councillor Morrison, uh, me, myself, and uh, Peter from Wadmaco and the exterior committee for one committee to in the beginning of this progress for them. And after that <coughs> was dissolved. Um, and he said, any declared conflict of interest prior to the body on the financial committee by council is request as well. If no conflict was stated, please declare the same for the public record. Any member of council who has peculiar interest in the proposal is in the conflict with the Municipal Conflict Act. Uh, if there is financial conflict present, this should be disclosed by the council. And she won that in the minutes. So, any discussion? Thank you. I just said, uh, I don't understand that. Could you just clarify that for me? Like, yeah. Who, who are okay. the members she of said, council that uh, have she, he wants to, if the, in the steward community, uh, any member of council in that moment make uh, uh, any, the, um, any vote for the financial. So it's like a, being in conflict, like a, you're in, this, in the community, the steward community, and you co he comes to council and you that give the money. In that time, and I can remember, uh, uh, Warren Morrison before was in the steward community, but before, they came to council and do we do the vote for that? He was stepped down for the same reason for don't be in uh, in in uh, how you call it in conflict. As I correct. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, I'd invite you to talk about what your timeline was if you were on the committee, the steering committee, or when you were not on the steering committee, because I believe we had a conversation about how you thought that it was a conflict, could be a conflict of interest, and Absolutely. you sit down. <clears throat> and uh, I'm just gonna enter into the conversation because I wanna make sure everybody else had their... So I was uh, originally, when the steering committee was set, I was asked as a municipal representative to sit in that board. And uh, not long after the uh, conversation became uh, more along the lines of community center and would there be involvement with uh, the municipality as far as renting and stuff like that, I sent a letter to the chair, I think March 9th, 2022, indicating that I was stepping away from that because it clearly would be a conflict of interest, so. Question, Warden, just so I'm clear in my mind, the the, uh, the rink, for lack of a better name, the Victoria County Highland Civic Center, has a board, right, a board of directors. The steering committee that is working on a new facility is a subcommittee of the board, right? Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And as you've just stated, you were asked, you were you were not originally, I think Council McLeod, you were originally on the board yeah. of the, yes, the board. Yeah. Center, right? So there were yeah. Were you two Gordon? You were asked yeah. to join the steering purpose. committee. I was not I'm not a member of the the uh, rink you're committee. You're not a member of the original but board. I was asked yeah. 
by the, by the board created yes. the steering committee and they approached five or six individuals and I was one of them. Yeah. And just with the start. You were not them. originally on the board. Of no, the I was not. Center. No. Okay. Thank you. I was at a couple of steering committee meetings with Councillor Longva. Uh, the committee of council was, and I think our MP and our MLA was at least at one of those meetings mm -hmm. also. And uh, we had a tour of the old facility, right. and and uh, they brought up concerns at at those meetings, what was involved, and they would be looking for a new rink facility. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time. That's basically what was asked. Yep. And that was the only two meetings I was at. Yeah, that's right. What council, if you'll all remember, what council offered to do was to fund through or to get Cape Breton Partnership to fund. One of us funded the consultant to talk about, to, to reach out to the community. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing I re regret is that we asked or that the consultant did a blue sky thinking on this because sounds like we have sounds like we the were going to committee back. has all the money in the world to um, build anything and everything. So if I had known that the consultant was going to do blue sky thinking, I would have pulled the reins back on that. So I didn't know at that point, but um as I saw it happening, I thought this is very bad. <laughs> okay. And I, I can assure you that if should the situation rise again, and I'm going to speak to the development, I will step I will step away and turn the chair over to the deputy ward. So there'll be it'll limit any confusion. I'll be speaking for my district, yep. and I agree with you. An investment of one million could potentially turn into twenty five million for my district. I guess I also want to say as councillors, anytime there's an initiative in our communities and our districts, I pretty well 100% of the time we're asked to be a member to get on board and see what our thoughts are on it and stuff like that. It's part of being a councillor. So to think that we're not going to be involved in, in decisions like that, I think is uh, not what the uh, the public expects. I know in my area, I'm expected that if something's going on, they, they want to know my input into it. So uh, I don't see any any wrongdoing whatsoever in any of their members uh, assisting that board at all. Okay. And, and I'm just I want to follow here because it's it's Council McLeod's district concerns and and you're you have a follow up for the for the conversation. Back, yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, just uh, yeah. that. Um, uh, huh. <laughs> that when you say that the other groups like went with this blue sky, I mean it's like why not think big? Why not want things for your community? And they didn't ask the, the steering committee to come up with the money. They just wanted to be part of what's supposed to be a community thing. It's supposed to be a community thing, but the community was being excluded and they still are being excluded. And those people aren't asking for money or for the steering committee to build them anything. They just wanna have input and maybe they're smart enough to come up with their own funding somewhere so that is steering committee issues that's not council issues well i think council should take a leadership with bringing people together in the community instead of being divisive when you say community you mean bedeck because in any of the interviews i heard on cbc everyone talks about the things in bedeck it's not rec and my three children played hockey here but you know mm -hmm. if there was a rock climbing wall in the deck probably people from Manganish would go and use it Most they likely. probably went to sydney when they had one yep, yep. we I have mean, we do have people that travel all the way up here to go hockey we go to shetty camp we go to sydney mm -hmm. but i guess my point again is that it's a, a village issue it's not a county issue because the village has 25 minutes i can go to port hawkesbury or i can go to sydney uh north sydney uh but if you're living in bay st lawrence or meat cove those areas you're two to three hours to get anywhere. And we're usually the only ones that show up at a lot of the hockey games and stuff is the people from North. Like I've gone to things when people from Sydney don't even show up at their own uh, hockey games and stuff. So again, it's not a council issue. Um, and you know, to say to think big and that the council should be doing it. Uh, again, if you, I'm sure if you pulled the county here to think that to build a facility like that in, in Bedeck, you'd probably get no from, from the, the councilors, at least North. And it's not that we don't want to see Bedeck has it, 
but it's it's not has a advantage to us. We have a rink in Cape North that uh, if somebody's interested, come down there and make that into a facility. I don't hear anything about that. But again, it's there's a group that put something together, came forward and asked for and did an excellent presentation and asked for our support. And that's what we do is we support groups that are willing to do something. So these other groups that want to do something, put a proposal together, bring it to council. And if and we'll do the same contingency, if you can get the federal and provincial funding, we'll support it. I mean, it's not a not rocket science, but again, instead of going on about it, let put your proposal together and bring it forward. Anything else, Councillor, or any other? No, just one, one other question. Uh, okay, for this new facility, uh, uh, supposedly no money was asked for, but Mr. Kerr, in your presentation, you said that uh, the village and uh, the county were not expected for zero dollars, I think. So what does that mean? Like we know right now, it's we're expected for a million dollars. Well, if if we're not expected not to have zero dollars, how many dollars are we expected to have towards? The what, well, that, that's not our concern. That's not that's the concern. concern. Well, no. Nothing in this village is your concern. No, no. The I, village is part of this county. Yeah. We all sit here and say this isn't a county issue. It is a county issue. The same as getting sewage infrastructure in Indonesia is a county issue. Right? Right. Things that want in this county that are going to make it better for everybody who lives here is a county issue. So sit here and say that it's not is bullshit, you guys. To you lower your voice and watch your language. Will be a, a county issue, yes. But you have to bring first one. You have to bring a presentation to council, not send it by email to each to just review it. Second, you have to bring a group of investor investors for as uh, uh, Warren uh, Deputy Warren uh, Larry said to bring and how much the, the community is going to put, and then we can put it. If you expect that we are going to come and just give me the amount that I have to put, what is your proposal? Where, where is the business plan? Who is your partners? Where is the land? Do you have land? Do you have an investment? So that is that is the way we ask in. We ask, let me finish. We are, we, we ask in, they come to council, make a present, a formal presentation with as you are criticizing the another uh, group is doing, but do it, how do you like to do it? But bring us what you want. Who is your partners? And how you want to make that happen? If you you asking, okay, we are have to do it for you. We don't have, We are going to do. Uh, you compare it as a, a, a facility uh, recreation for uh, the water and sewer for uh, for residents. Are you going to compare that? Okay. So so Stephen. Well, yeah. You told me almost four years ago yeah. to get people in this community together and come forward and put together a proposal. Where is it? Yeah. And that's what I did. I didn't mean, mail it out. I sent it to you. I sent all the information. Yeah. Right? Where is the group? From multiple groups. In Who is the group? Far out of the Who are the group? Because the only person I see is a group is you. Okay. Who is your group? Okay. Who is your who is your who is the people you're talking for? Okay, so we're gonna know? let Steve respond. The uh, basketball, soccer groups, all of these people are looking for places to have a venue in this community. That's all I'm saying. I didn't ask anybody to spend one dollar on any you look at that document that I said, is there any dollars in there? Is there a proposal in there that I asked council for money? What this was was a vision for this for this community that I all advise there that it's not about the whole town. If I lived in Indian, it would be about Indian, but I don't happen to live there. So, so why you why you are instead of being a supporter of your community for another people, another group, instead why you want to just boycott that? Sorry. Why you want not, why you want to boycott one uh, this group? Boycott this boycott. group. Boycott. Boycott. What she's saying is you seem to be against the ring. You're against against the, the ring. Against if somebody is doing something, bringing twenty four million for 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 a community, you are against of that? Really? Because so why are you against? But what you against? So I I'm just gonna just. Just hold this conversation here. No, no, but well, yeah, okay. Yes, there was. Yes, there was yes. a ring. Yeah. So if you want to bring your proposal forward where 
we don't want to, so our objective is not to own any of these. Oh, I know. We don't want to own right. No. So if so, you you said you don't want us to spend any money. No, so either, well, I don't uh, know. You 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 did. You just did. Okay, just did one it. at a time, you please. Say that. So if you want to come forward, just hold on, Steve. Just hold if you on, come Steve. forward with your with your proposal, this proposal, which council has not reviewed as a whole. No, but somebody said they did. They reviewed it twice. And no one inside you also the said council. you also the you document was so circulated. Somebody to said us. we yeah. in error. He acknowledged that he said in error. You said Bedeck several times, but you didn't acknowledge that you said Bedeck. It's county. We're county. We are not Bedeck. Yeah. So if you want to bring your proposal forward with a solution of how it's going to be done, we're all ears for that. So we are. I'm no. telling you, we are. I'm telling you right now, we are. We're not. We're not backing out, We're not backing out on this. Stephen? Stephen? You bring yours forward. Who yep. says there's only one spot? You come forward with a solu with your solution, and we'll see if we can back it. So, Stephen, I'm saying to you right now on behalf of council, if you get a presentation, you want to come to council, that door is open. It's open. And when you bring it in, it, it will stand on its own. We will give it the same consideration that we gave to the rink. Just keep in mind that the rink has been here, it's been operated by this community for 46 years. And from our perspective as a municipality, we don't want to be the only municipality in this province with no indoor ice facility because it is a major piece of infrastructure that's required to keep people here and to get people to come here. So I, I think we've, we've, we've all had our chance to express our thoughts, our frustrations. And I'm just gonna, if you don't mind, I'm gonna leave it here today. You got uh, a proposal you wanna bring to council and I can't emphasize this enough. That door is open. By who? Pardon me? By who? By all of you. There, you told me to go up to the village. Not your problem. I don't know why you're trying to do it for you. But I'm not going to get a break. That's what you told me. So I went to the village. Yeah. It's supposed to the village. You explain the same issue to them as I explained to you. We've got failing infrastructure. Not necessary to just do this. Yeah. And what was I told? Not mine. Nothing's not mine, too. We don't own any of this infrastructure. We don't maintain it. We don't do anything with it. So I tell you this falling apart. I tell you we need to do something about this. You say, go away. Not our problem. And you're happy that the rape committee shows up. John and Mr. Trevor. All of a sudden, it's an issue. The rape is falling apart. We had an engineer's report now says it's falling down. Can you give us some advice and guidance on what we should do? Next thing you know, the county is involved in this thing. That if you're half an old, you want to do it. Yep, two things. Two things. No. I got the floor. If you let me speak. I will. I came to this council and I talked about this building and said that you were talking about accessibility issues about this building. And I wrote to a letter and said, please don't spend any more money in this building. Start thinking about the multi purpose building in which you guys could be in. And what was the response? We're not doing anything, we're pretty certain we're going to stay here. Da -da -da -da. So here we are. We're here now, four years later, four years of planning, four years of potentially, we could have been raising money, and we're not. We're still at ground zero. So, are you looking for us to tell you that you're right? Is that what you're looking for? No, what I'm trying to say is. You don't seem to be any sense of planning ahead, looking ahead. There's no vision here. I, I'm, okay, you you had your time. You had your say. Guess yeah, what? No, no, Guess great. What? No, per, no Perla, I think we're it's just uh, just let me say something. Yes, we have this building in uh, it's an issue. Yes, the ring what is have an issue. But now, right now, there are trying to fix the solution. If you want to be part of that, maybe you are not part in that solution. But right now, the solution is getting in. We, we are there, the rink is, is trying to fix that solution because the, the building is crumble. And ours, well, they give us a, 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 a they're asking us if it will be possible to move there. So that issue that you address, now they're getting solutions. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I just want to add to that in the final word, if 
is that over time, you talk about the rink. We knew it was in, we all knew that those of us that live here, it wasn't getting any better every day. I don't think anybody knew how serious those issues were until the engineers went in and looked at it. Right? So we're good. That was, and that was after you had, I think after, it doesn't matter. But when the, when the facts came in, the facts came in. It's a serious issue. Same thing with this building. You, we could have people look at this building and say, you know, just uh, throw uh, some new siding around the top of it. Then when we had the uh, inspectors come in and take a look at it, they said it's, it's way more than we ever thought it was going to be. So now we're faced with, we get the double. So it, it's not from lack of planning. We, we had these things in our sights. And I can assure you that if... Uh, they're part of our plan as we go forward. We're going to support a new facility. We're going to have to deal with this building, and it comes with lots of conversation as well. So anyway, th this is kind of concludes our conversation today. I thank you for having the interest to come to council. I thank you for expressing your your views and your frustrations. May I ask you just a little bit? What's the public here? Invite the public to come to me. I didn't think that anyway. When? All you had to do is put your hand up. You know, we. we here, what? You were here. But all you have to do, Steve, it's just the same. You had your opportunity to speak this afternoon. Anybody can come in here, and, and it's up to the individual. If they want to speak, all I have to do is put their hand up, dress the chair. We'll let anybody speak. People have done it lots in the past. I would invite you, if you come back and you want to speak, you let me know, you can speak, just as we let you speak this afternoon. How's this? How's this? We will do that. That's an easy fix. Okay? I, I, I guarantee you. And same as I said earlier, you want to come back and present to council anytime, contact our staff. We will give you a date. We'll give you a perimeter of how much time we usually allow. We don't always stick to the minute. It just sometimes depends on the day and the time and the issue. And that's part of it. So we good? Okay. Uh, okay. Any other so, uh, district? So again, um, she here is requesting a copy of the minutes posted to the public viewing. So I just like uh, put it is after we, there will be approved after now we need just like they always are like all after, right? Science um, 18, after each council session we do that right so it's after the, the next council session, council session those meetings get approved. <laughs> yeah, that's all. And I, and that's it. Uh, my public works. Uh, Concerns they're sending to Stephen McDonough, MLA, and MLA Kidbay. And that's it. Thank you, Councillor. I'm just going to step out of the chair for a minute. I just have a motion to make. Actually, I don't. It's a report. Sorry. My apologies. Um, just I uh, have a, a resident that's interested in solar power. I know that we have a uh, uh, bylaw that allows for uh, water and sewer. For lending. For lending. For lending of them, yes. Can we include, or do we have to create another policy if somebody wants to use, if we it's can encourage them? for clean energy. For clean energy. Yes. That's, that's, we have, we have it. Okay. For clean energy. So we I already can, have that in place. We have, that's why I was confused. So with that, I would just ask that individual to get in touch with you. Okay, great. Uh, he has a great project. The other thing I just want to mention under district concerns, we had a, a priority planning session done last week. And uh, I just want to thank council and staff for their participation in that. And it speaks to our priority planning for the next two years. And I think it was well identified. So I just want to mention that. Back to just a request from uh, Mayor Chisholm and uh, Mayor Beaton and uh, Warden Mumbriket. I had that I under other. Uh, I had that. Yeah, oh, sorry. Sorry, I had it. Gone. I thought I had it under other but we're there. She's ready to leave, so that's why. So, who are we going I to nominate Councillor McNeil? Go to. Okay, do we have a second for that? Second by Councillor Longbow in favor? Aye. Time to remind it. You might want to ask him if he's interested. Yeah. Okay. 
Do we, sorry, do we ask to the public too? Sorry? Move by Fraser, seconded by Bob. All in favor? I have discussion, sorry. Yeah. Sorry? I have discussion. About um, the yeah. green energy? Yeah. Okay, sorry, uh, go ahead. Because they're asking, I know it's yeah. for you. Uh, I don't know that you want to put a, a for interest, a public of interest, somebody would like to sit down as a community member. They, yeah, that's an excellent point. Maybe what we'll do is a counselor, a counselor and, and, a, and a public of yeah. interest. If there's somebody is interested in that, right? Because it's yeah. very important uh, decisions there. Yeah, it is. Maybe some qualified people about that. Good point. We will check with them to see if they do too. Then we'll. Because I believe they said there would be some qualifications that, yeah, and if we have somebody that's that uh, designation, we do. Steve that. actually has some qualifications. Well, he can apply if he's interested. In. Mm -hmm. um, any committee reports? You just said you had one. I had one, yeah. I was just seeing if anybody else had one before I spoke. Planning Advisory Committee for Victoria County, which just represents most of the deck and part of uh, Councilor McLeod's. We met last week, and um, once the uh, standard planning goes across the municipality, there will be uh, area advisory committees for different locations. Like you could have one in Inganesh, you could have one in North Shore. So we already have a Planning Advisory Committee that represents mostly the deck. So we're moving that committee towards being an area advisory committee. Just a little update for, what? for land use oh. and zoning. So we have it right now just within the village, but it's under the county. So when we get municipal wide uh, minimum planning standards, it'll be across the county and there'll be probably four or five of these area uh, advisory committees that you'll start up in your areas, your areas. Uh, so we're going to try shift this one into uh, this to the village, more or less, or the confines of the village. Um, we did the task force. Is there anything else to ask for correspondence? Oh, I'm sorry, cor any correspondence? Yeah, so it's all been sent. All been sent. Yeah, and I think we received, I've sent out to you. And there's no and like a big no on the golf carts today. No to the golf carts. That's three strikes. And they were electric vehicles, kind of. So anyway, people keep thinking they're golf carts, but that's, I didn't see it, but I, anyway. Um, the next meeting is February 21st. And... But the first of budget days, is that right? And the morning will be budget. And uh, uh, we'll set the time. Oh, we're not sure yet. We'll set the time. And there's potentially an event here that I cancel to attend. It's not confirmed yet, but it'd be at one o'clock on that date. When I get the details, I'll send it out. So. And the grant uh, applications are due so they have nothing to do with our but i guess they have something to do with our budget but not really there's just a, a certain pot of money and then we just kind of decide, decide at the council. end yeah. Oh, okay mm -hmm. yeah thank you just one yes more. councilor mcneil just one more Michael. yeah <laughs> one more for the grant applications that those organizations just a reminder for those organizations that want to be taxed exempt they have to fill in again that form they that do year. every year so, yes yeah. and tick the box off yeah exactly mm -hmm. so it's a one-stop shop to, form yeah and then, so they have to tick the box okay. off and the budget is a public meeting and the other point i know alex sent this around we're looking for anybody that knows somebody with a financial background ideally or anybody that has a general interest we need a public a member of the public for that audit committee correct that's been extended to february 17th Looks so if you know that. anybody it's uh, we would and they can be from anywhere and if they come from somewhere we will cover their costs for their travel and incidentals that they may require <laughs> you actually did count them. 
and and this email refers to in the hundreds so and uh it's very hard on appliances too they don't <laughs> like that at all so <clears throat> with that as mentioned on the 21st uh bill nova scotia will be here for broadband update they're joining virtually i guess that hopefully we'll have service that day so um that's our next date at council and we need a motion to adjourn please councillor oregon seconded by i don't think we need a second or so thank you for your time interest this afternoon did we have any we didn't have any questions